Sub call. Beyond blue horizons, far at the world's end, strange, fascinating lands beckon us, bid us revel in their exotic splendors. Come with us as we head for Ports of Call. Over the Atlantic we journey, with our bows pointed at a land of fable and adventure, a land of jungle and felt, of juju and devil dances, of towering forest and steaming swamp, a country where witchcraft thrives, and the echoing footsteps of ancient adventurers still ring upon the ears of those who follow. Central Africa lies before us. With the equatorial sun blazing down out of a cloudless sky, we approach the west coast of Africa, a coast peopled with rays of old pirate ships and slave-trading Moorish dhows that once haunted its coves and inlets. This is the fever coast of Africa, spoken of with awe and greed by the traders of ancient Carthage, fought over by both Portuguese and English, Dutch and French, and finally divided among them. Sierra Leone lies directly ahead, as we near the land and penetrate the haze of heat, we see a town spreading over the lower slopes of bush-covered hills with low cliffs separating the houses from the waterline. In the distance, a fleet of large sailing gigs loaded with passengers and produce from the Bullam shore, their huge white sails hanging far over to leeward, tack in toward the harbor as we drop anchor in Freetown, our port of call. Freetown sprang into being toward the end of the 18th century, when England, after the abolition of slavery, transported ex-slaves and formed a colony in Sierra Leone, now using the port as a naval coaling station. Sierra Leone was well known to the ancients. From the country around, the Phoenicians and Carthaginians obtained their spices, ivory and gold, which built up their huge resources. Carthage, on the north, colonized the west coast as far as Sierra Leone and jealously guarded her trade routes until Rome usurped her power. Very little of old Carthage remains. In the Museum of Bardo is a profile relief of Masinissa, the great fighting king of the Numidians. The story of his unrequited love is interwoven with the defeat of the Carthaginians in the Second Punic Wars. Masinissa was betrothed to Sophonispa, the beautiful daughter of a Carthaginian general. And our story opens in Spain, where Masinissa is fighting for Carthage against the Roman legions. A messenger stands before him. Well... Has the council decided to give me more men? Or do they want to borrow some of mine to get them out of another blundering mistake? Speak, man! Don't stand there gaping! Your Majesty, I fear the news I bring will cause anger to rise in your heart. And as I am but the means by which the news is brought to your ears, I therefore beg personal immunity. Hmm. As bad as that, eh? All right. Immunity and safety granted. I thank your Majesty for this... Come on, the newsman! Spit it out! 
I'm no politician, I'm a fighter. Syphax, king of the Massasalians, entered into an alliance with Rome. By the gods. But Carthage has won him back, your majesty. In the name of Baal. How did they manage that? Did they trick him or promise him my kingdom, which he'll never get? The council has made it impossible for Syphax to fight for Rome, your majesty. They've given the lady Sophonisba to him in marriage. What? They've given... Say that again. Say that again. Quick, man, out with it before I take your throat in my hands. Steady, Massinissa. You've promised the man safety. Yes. Yes, so I have, Gatan. But let him repeat that. Messenger, repeat that statement. The council at Carthage has given the lady Sophonisba in marriage to Syphax, king of the Massasalians. So, they've taken my affianced wife and given her to Syphax. Hmm. Tell me, does Hasrubal, her father, know of this? It was done without his knowledge, Your Majesty. All right. Guard, see that this man is well clothed and fed. Give him money that he may return to his home. You may go. Thank you, Your Majesty. Is there anything I can say or do to help you, Masinissa? No, my friend. They've taken from me the one thing I loved most. There's nothing left to me now but war. War against those who have done this treacherous thing. But it was Carthage. Would you fight against Carthage? There's no need for you to do so, Gatan, or my other generals. The decision is mine alone. Your decision is mine, my king. I, too, have decided. And I know the men will follow. General Gatan. Your Majesty, my friend. And so began the downfall of a great power. Masinissa allied himself with the Roman general Scipio. And when Carthage at last was brought to submission, and Masinissa proclaimed king of Numidia, he went at once to the great palace at Sirta, where Sophonisba awaited him, and they were married. Meanwhile, Syphax, held prisoner by Scipio, laid his plans carefully. General Scipio, I suppose you're aware of the nature of Masinissa's hurried trip to Sirta? Yes, I think so. It was to claim the wife whom you stole from him, Syphax. Well, call it that if you will. But do you realize what Sophonisba will set herself out to do? There's always that to be considered, you know. What do you mean? Masinissa has been, and still is, very valuable to Rome. Of course. I doubt if we'd have ended the war so soon without him. And I hope you realize the intense patriotism of Sophonisba toward Carthage. What are you getting at, Syphax? Explain yourself. Well, to put the situation briefly, the first thing Sophonisba will do will be to set herself the task of weaning Masinissa away from Rome and back to Carthage. Hmm. I'll confess I've never given that angle a thought. Then, in all fairness to yourself and to Rome, I'd advise you to go deeply into the matter. Sophonisba is a very beautiful and clever woman, and Masinissa is deeply in love with her. Yes, and I can't afford to lose Masinissa just yet. Besides, Rome will need his cooperation. If you're going to do anything about it, General, and knowing Masinissa, you'd better act at once. Yes, that's true. Oh, here he comes now. Evidently straight back from Sitter. Oh. Well, uh, I'll go out into the garden for a little while. Hello, Scipio. Hey, you look worried. That's no mood to be in when I'm so happy. Haven't you a welcome for me? I'm afraid, Masinissa, I have some bad news for you. Oh, come now. How could any news be bad when I've just married the most beautiful woman on earth? Come on, Scipio, cheer up. It's that which is worrying me. I must forbid your marriage to Sophonisba. What's that? Forbid my marriage? But you can't. I am married. Syphax is a prisoner. As good as dead. What else could prevent me from... Rome can prevent you, Masinissa. It is the decree of Rome. The decree of Rome? And that means... It means if you continue with your marriage to Sophonisba, Rome will take her from you. She will be humiliated before all people. Oh, I see. So Rome is afraid of a woman. Is that your final decree? There will be no alteration? There will be no alteration. Very well. I must talk to my wife and make arrangements for the future. My husband, I have awaited you these past two hours. Awaited me? How did you know I was coming? I have my spies, and bad news travels fastest of all. Then you know? Yes, Rome cannot trust me. It's what I expected. And there is but one way out, Masinissa. Yes, for both of us. No, no, for me alone. You must remain. There is much for you to do. I'd planned that we go together, but we... I know, but that shall not be. 
Give me the poison that you have brought with you. But, my dear, how can Give I... Give it to me. There is honor ahead for you, Masinusa. I would not have it otherwise. You see, I have a cup ready by my side. It will be so easy. You must give me your word that you will go on to greater glories. Yes. Yes, I shall go on. Alone. Alone. Don't be sad, my dear. I drink to the greatness of King Masinissa. Ah. It is done. Hold me. Gently. Sopranisba, my love. There will be no dishonor. There will be only greatness for you and for me. Peace. With the loss of Carthaginian sea power, African exploration was at a standstill for centuries. During the 15th century, Prince Henry of Portugal sent many expeditions to this coast, and in 1454 obtained a papal bull from Pope Nicholas V, granting all lands in Africa south of Cape Bojadori to Portugal. For nearly a century afterwards, the Portuguese roamed undisturbed in these parts, trading in ivory, spices, and gold. But when the Reformation came, England and Holland were past fearing the anger of Rome and set out to take what they could. Later, France joined in the merry chase. But this fever-infested coast took a huge toll of lives apart from the fighting. Expedition after expedition was wiped out by fever alone. And the terrible bite of Benin took on the proportions of a nightmare to all sailors bound for that region. In the 17th century on the Gold Coast, the Portuguese concentrated mainly on keeping their forts at Elmina and Exum, which guarded their gold mines. The first and richest mine was the Aprobe. But due to faulty construction of the tunnels, which were run into the hill, the mine collapsed, burying hundreds of natives. Urged by their witch doctors, the native chiefs refused to allow the mine to be reopened, and the Portuguese made for the interior and found another hill of gold, which was called Aboase, which means under the stone, so named because of a huge granite rock which sat on the apex of the hill. Not long after the Aboase mine became a working factor, the chief of the Awuans, upon the advice of his witch doctor, called a council of warriors. The next morning at the Abuasi mine, the Portuguese engineer in charge is talking with his assistant. What's the matter with the natives, Philippe? They seem sullen and restless today. I had a lot of trouble persuading them to enter the shafts this morning, sir. They've been talking some sort of nonsense about a spirit who lives in the hill. Uh-huh. That's it, eh? Same old spirit trouble. I thought we'd overcome that. Now I come to think of it, the drums were talking quite a bit last night. Hello. Isn't that Chief Ducale coming this way? It looks like him, sir. Oh? You're right, sir. The guard just stopped him. All right, guard. Let him come through. Now we'll find out what the trouble is. I expect that old rascal of a witch dogger, Mdogo, has been starting something to worry us. Morga, Lord Whiteman. Good morning, Chief Ducale. He looks a little excited, doesn't he, sir? Well, Ducale, what's the business that brings you from your hut? It is serious business, Lord Whiteman. Last night, when moon full... Spirit of Abawasi, come among warriors, speak to them. Well, that's interesting. And what did the spirit of the hill have to say? Spirit speak of his brother, Aprobi. Aprobi, eh? What does that mean, sir? The Aprobi mine collapsed a few years ago, burying all the natives and soldiers we had in there. The natives say the spirit of the hill gave a warning before it happened. <laughs> Pure superstition, of course. And as spirit Aprobi gave warning for white man to cease disturbing him, so did spirit of Abawasi. Speak last night. I see. Tell me, Chief Tokali, through whose mouth did the spirit of Abuwasi speak? Through mouth of appointed one, Dogo. Yes, I thought so. He's been doing his best to shut up this He's been doing his best to shut up this mine ever since we started tunneling. Oh, here's a message in, uh, coming from the mine, sir. Yes. It's one of Pigali's men. Senor Pigali would like to speak with you in the rear tunnel, sir. Very well. I'll be along shortly. Yes, sir. Mm. What does Lord Whiteman say to warning of spirit Abawasi? He make many of my people work in hill, bringing golden treasure of Abawasi into light of sun. Does Lord Whiteman wish vengeance of Abawasi to fall on them? Look here, Tokali. You people allow the disaster of the Aprobi mine to weigh too heavily in your arguments. It's a well-known fact that the mine was dangerous. It had no bracings inside to hold the tunnels open. 
But we've taken all precautions here to make the Abawasi mine safe. Every tunnel is properly held up with timbers. Spirit of Abawasi, mightier than tree which white man use. White man has disturbed slumbers of spirit of hill. Oh, we've been through all this before, Tokali. Then shall Tokali call his people from tunnels in hill? No. Your people cannot leave the mine. My soldiers are keeping them at work. And they'll continue to do so until I see fit to bring them out. Lord white man, my warriors impatient. They have heard voice of spirit. If your warriors begin to make trouble, Tokali, I shall seek you out personally and hang you to the nearest tree. I have spoken. It is well, Lord white man. Tokali has delivered message of spirit. Tokali, go. Go in peace. And keep your warriors in order. Let him go through, guard. Is there going to be trouble, sir? I hope not. We'll have to double the night guards and just trust to luck. Over there. Big Daru. Philippe. Oh, that's Pigali calling. Look, he's holding something up to show us. Come on. He's probably found a large nugget. He said there was a thick vein near the entrance of that back tunnel. Ooh, it's hot today. There doesn't seem to be much sun. I think we're in for a storm. Hello, Pigali. So you found one, eh? Yes. It's a beauty, too. Look at it. Hmm. That's one of the largest we've brought out yet. Tell me. How are the natives behaving inside? Oh, they're very restless, but the soldiers are keeping them at work. They're talking a lot about the spirit of the hill being angry. Yes, I know. We'll have to do something about this. What's that? What is it? The ground shaking. Good heavens, it's an earthquake. Steady, Philippe. It's over now. It was only a very short one. But, but what is it? Well, there's been no damage, sir. No, thank goodness it was a light shock. Here's one of the soldiers. What was that, sir? The natives inside the tunnels are terrified. It was just a slight earth shock. All over now. Go back and tell Lieutenant Gala to keep the natives working. Yes, sir. Wouldn't it be safer to let them go, sir? There might be another earthquake, and then it would really... Uh, If we did, it would take us weeks to round them up again. No, I think it's all over. Look out, sir. Here's another one. Run. Run. Run for your lives. That's the end of the Abawasi mine. Oh, isn't there something we can do, sir? All those natives and soldiers in there? No. No, there's nothing we can do. We can't even get into the mine. The huge rock that formed the top of the hill has broken away and completely covered the entrance. They're all buried alive. The spirit of Abawasi kept its word. The native warriors, fearing the gods' vengeance was not complete, captured the remaining Portuguese and sealed them up alive in the rear tunnel of the mine. Later, the Dutch came to this part of the coast, but the Awuans held them off for a year until the Hollanders sent another powerful coast tribe, the Ahantas, against them. Which tribe holds the territory today under English rule? <laughs> The Africa that constitutes the hunter's paradise, the Africa of Livingstone and Stanley, stretches in from the east coast. Tanganyika, Kenya, Uganda, these are names to make the big game hunter's heart quicken. For over the vast grazing lands of these territories, the African game roams in herds. Antelope, zebra, giraffe, and ostrich. And where the herds are found, there stalks the lion. The bands of elephant are not so numerous as they were. The ivory trade has taken a great toll. But the quick-tempered rhinoceros, a marvel of agility for his bulk, can still be found snorting and stamping his short-sighted way about the plains. In the rivers, the crocodile and hippopotamus still give the safari much food for thought. Just off the east coast is the island of Zanzibar, with its oriental atmosphere and ivory markets, where the old slave blocks of the Arabs can still be seen. It was from here in 1870 that Stanley set out on his memorable journey across the eastern portion of Africa to find the missionary explorer, Dr. Livingstone, from whom the whole world had been breathlessly awaiting news for the last five years. Outfitting at Bagomayo on the mainland, Stanley traveled over wild and practically uncharted country to reach Ujiji on the shores of Lake Tanganyika. Fever, poisonous insects, wild beasts, and hostile natives were daily occurrences. 
but the incessant booming of native drums ate into the brains of the two white men who went with him. One of these was an English sailor named Shaw. Fevers, sickness, and heat had caused this man's nerves to be strained to the breaking point. They are in camp, and the native drums keep up their incessant booming until each beat seems to force itself against the sailor's brain. Oh, God. Those drums have been going for days. Why in heaven's name don't they stop? I can't stand much more of this. I can't, I know I can't. Nothing but sweat and slime and grinning either natives and, and them blasted drums are beating, beating, beating into me brain. I've got to get away from here. I've got to get away. Away from these here crawling things and filth and, and them drums. Oh, stroof, I, I can't even shut out the sound of them when it covers up my ears. It seems to beat and throb right through my body. Stanley over there, lying in his tent and taking no notice of him. Oh, God, why don't they stop? Why don't they stop? Blimey, I must be going balmy. I can't stand this no longer. Stanley ain't got no nose. He goes on as if he's used to it. Used to this awful heat and sweat and, and them drums. <sighs> what did he bring me here for? White man ain't got no business being in this blasted country. I've got to get out of here. I've got to move. Oh, God, them drums. No, no, I tell you, I won't do it. I won't. Why did I say that? What made me say that? How did I... Holy saints, it's the drums. The drums are saying, kill Stanley, kill Stanley. They're telling me to kill Stanley. No, no, I won't do it. I tell you, I won't. I, I can't do it. I got to go on with this heat and slime and stinking natives. But before I'm through, I'll, I'll be a madman. I know it. A madman. Yes. Madman. 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 Kill Stanley. Kill Stanley. Oh, God, won't those drums stop? inside the opening, foot and a half off the ground. He brought me here. Stanley got me into this. Kill Stanley. Kill Stanley. Ah, oh, it's done fever. Kill Stanley. Kill Stanley. My gun. Kill Stanley. Kill Stanley. Kill Stanley. Foot and a half off the ground. Kill Stanley, kill, Stanley, kill, Stanley, kill, Stanley, kill. For the love of heaven, what have I done? What have I done? What made me do it? Why did I do that? Hey there, Shaw. You, Shaw. What was that shot? What's the shooting about? Good. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Stanley. Uh, what, what shooting do you mean? Can you stand there with a smoking gun in your hand and ask me what's shooting? What did you fire at? I, I, that, that is Mr. Stanley. I, 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 I thought I saw a native. Yes, that's it. A thief going towards your tent. Oh, uh, a thief, eh? Yes, yes, a thief. Is, is there anything wrong? No, no, nothing wrong. Only, I'd advise you to be more careful where you fire next time. That bullet went through my tent just above me. And if I'd been hurt, some very ugly reports might have reached civilization. However, I, I think you'd better take a stiff dose of quinine, and we'll say no more about it. It was Stanley's understanding and dogged perseverance that later made his historic meeting with Dr. Livingstone possible. From then on, his one ambition was to follow the course of the great Congo River from the interior to the coast. The story of his travels in that savage region reads like fiction. But civilization has slowly tried to follow him. Trade and Christianity is spreading itself gradually over the central parts of this dark continent. Palm oil, rubber, ebony and ivory now reach the sea by way of the Congo. And railroad communication has advanced considerably. 
schools in the cities of the coast and missions in the districts of the interior typify the influence of the white man. But Africa remains Africa, silent and mysterious, brooding under inflexible native laws, the origins of which are lost in legend's mournful wail. Africa, where the myriad voices of nature join in a symphony of the jungle, where overhanging vines trellis a fantasy of twilight on the forest path, where safety lies in attack and the lifeblood of the weak flows into the veins of the strong. Once more, the ship which brought us to these shores has weighed her anchor. And as Freetown drops gradually away behind, we know we shall always carry in our memories the picture of Africa's palm-fringed beaches, her dew-soaked forests, and the sound of a jungle symphony that never dies. I invite you to join us again next week at this time as we journey to another of the world's fascinating ports of call.